Yay! It looks like we're on air at last. Wow. Well, as usual, <laughs> the internet gremlins uh, have been attacking blog pause. Welcome to everyone who is in attendance today for Blog Pause Cares and Shares. I'm Yvonne DeVita, the co-founder, and I have some really fantastic guests today for this very special hangout. Um, we wanted to talk about this issue that has been all over the internet and certainly all over Facebook. Everyone's asking, what is the canine flu and how is it going to affect blog pause. So today we brought together two guests, um, Steve Dale, who everyone knows, who will tell you a little bit more about what he's up to these days, and Jill Lopez from Merrick, who is a veterinarian, and she will tell you a little bit also. But let's start with you, Steve, because you were instrumental in helping us put this together, and, and I want to thank you for that. Tell us what you're up to these days, and give a little overview for anyone watching who might not be familiar with you, which I just can't imagine, but could be. <laughs> well, this, this is not at all about me. I write newspaper columns. I'm on the radio. I'm on television. And on one of my shows, on the WGN radio show in Chicago, was about, I think, six weeks ago uh, that we had our county veterinarian on the show, Dr. Donna Alexander. Now, she was there to talk about some low-cost rabies clinics and, and some other things that Cook County is doing. That's my local as opposed to my national radio shows. So we, we talk about local issues related to Chicago, where I'm at. And I had been hearing about some upper respiratory thing that had been going around town. And I asked Dr. Alexander at a commercial break if she was hearing the same thing, and she said yes. And we talked about it at the break and what veterinarians are I said, this doesn't sound like Bordetella, which is kennel cough. It sounds more like the dog flu which we had seen in Chicago uh, an outbreak of uh, in 2008. I said, this is really very similar to me. We came on the air and we suggested that was the case very carefully because at that time there was no absolute proof that this mm -hmm. wasn't Portatella, kennel cough, or a strain of that. Uh, but we carefully said this might be dog flu, and I talked about vaccination and why that would be, and incidentally still is, important. Uh, well, it turned out that uh, we now know today that there was and continues to be an outbreak, actually an epidemic is a better word, of dog flu, the canine influenza virus in Chicago. And I'll let Dr. Jill explain why this dog flu is a bit different than what we've seen, in fact, quite a bit different than what we saw in 2008 or, in fact, what America has ever seen. But I want to make a point of, before I let Dr. Lopez talk. Uh, I want to make a point of saying this is not the Chicago dog flu. It, 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 the borders of Chicago, first of all, it's in the suburbs here too. But, but it, I'm really, you're la I get this a lot, you know, and what we're seeing now are dogs in other places. Sadly, this hit during spring break. Yeah. So people were traveling even more. And people take their dogs with them. And the weather in Chicago, uh, after our winter, which I believe lasted 17 months this this yeah, past time around, <laughs> finally, finally <laughs> began to break and the weather began to get warmer. All that happened at the same time that this was happening. So you have people traveling all over. And we are going to see probably, in my little crystal ball, other incidents of dog flu or the canine influenza virus, the same strain that we're seeing in Chicago in other cities. I'm concerned, however. I'm concerned that it is possible <laughs> that we may see outbreaks in other cities. Uh, and I'll mm -hmm. let Jill explain what so, exactly this that we're seeing in Chicago. Yeah, Jill, uh, before you tell us a little more about yourself, I want to make sure that we look um, at some of the questions coming in from the audience. And people are actually uh, concerned, as are all of us who are organizing the conference, how this is going to affect blog posts because we already have 85 dogs oh. registered. Um, I assume they're bringing their people, but I know 85 dogs will be there. Uh, so, so I'm going to read out loud here that um, Talent Hounds is interested in understanding the risk as it relates to Toronto. Very interesting. Um, well, Toronto is very close to Chicago. Mm. <laughs> so and then, um, people are traveling a lot. 
Yeah, Ashley uh, wants to know about the vaccine, and uh, Jerry G. Dog, who was our tripods folks, say they are avoiding the dog flu vaccine for Wyatt, uh, one of their tripod uh, pets. So, so these are things, these are just some of the questions I sent you, a couple of others from my team that are similar to these. So Jill, tell us a little bit about your background at Merck and, and your veterinary skills, and then talk to us about what does all this mean? Okay. Well, I like to call this flu the Steve Dell Pet World dog flu. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, Steve. Let us name it the Chicago dog flu. <laughs> so, um, so the Steve Dell <laughs> dog flu, <laughs> formerly known as Chicago dog flu. Um, anyway, um, I can joke with Steve because I've known him for many, many years. Um, I've been a veterinarian for many years. I've worked for several companies. Um, now I work at Merck Animal Health, which is based, and I'll show you in a little bit, in beautiful... New Jersey. Um, a lot of people think New Jersey is not a beautiful place, but it's gorgeous. So before I leave, I promise to show you how beautiful the Garden State is. All right. Um, but um, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, around mid-March um, in, in Merck, um, our sales reps have they stay in contact with veterinary clinics, and they happen to mention that there was an increase in dogs coughing, which is common anytime. There's like a spring break coming up or any time that dogs are being kenneled, you're going to see an increase in the incidence of respiratory disease. But this wasn't normal. This was, um, some of the veterinarians were seeing 5 to 15 cases each day. So it was very abnormal. It's, it's something strange was going on. And it wasn't just one clinic, it was a lot of clinics. So we, we reached out to the veterinarians in, in the Chicago area and surrounding towns, and we did a sampling program where we paid for testing of nasal swabs of dogs that were recently ill from that area. Um, and we, we worked with the Cornell University Diagnostic Lab. So uh, before this, some of the vets had sent out samples to another diagnostic lab, and the interesting thing was is the results were inconclusive. Many of the results were negative and um, the ones that they had positives were things that shouldn't cause such severe signs and shouldn't be spreading like this. So we knew something was really unusual so we worked with Cornell closely. Um, they gathered the data and we've submitted probably, I, would, I don't have the final numbers, but more than 400 um, samples at this point and we've had well over 200 come back positive for dog flu. Uh, initially, we thought it was canine influenza H3N8. This virus was found in Florida in 2004. It's an equine-derived virus that jumps species to dogs. Oops. And a lot of people are aware of it oh. that came out in 2009. Um, so initially, we thought it was the flu because it does fit with the flu. The flu is very hard to diagnose, um, and it's also very infectious. But still, <laughs> something wasn't right. There was something very odd about this. Um, so Dr. Dubovi, who, who heads up the Cornell University, looked into it clo more closely, and he started noticing that things, it wasn't, it wasn't the exact thing that we've seen before. It was not h 3 and 8 Something was funny. So they found out on, um, I think it was April 12th, um, they actually discovered it wasn't H3N8, which had been in the U.S. since 2004. It was H3N2, um, and that is a completely different. It's an influenza virus, but it's a completely different one. This one is from avian species that has jumped from the avian or birds into dogs, and it was an Asian. Um, it was an Asian ancestry, wow. I guess you could say. Um, it had been first found in. Chicago, I'm sorry, not Chicago, in China in 2006. And within further best investigation, we found that, or Cornell found, that it was exactly like the, um, the type of H3N8 or H3N2 that was found in Korea. So we, during this, we found this new, you know, new to North America virus. Um, and and now, then everything started making sense because... It spread like canine flu. Um, it spread like crazy. All these dogs were getting sick. Um, and also, the signs were more severe than what you'd see with other types of kennel cough, um, like Bordetella, for instance. 
with Bordetella, you don't see a dog with fever. And a lot of these dogs that were coming into the veterinary clinic had very high fevers. Um, some of them developed pneumonia. Um, so it wasn't like what we normally saw. So everything started so to make Jill, sense once we found that. So I, I want to jump ahead a little um, in the interest of time. I, that's wonderful sure. information for us to have this background and I know Steve has some information also. Um, the the attendees and the folks watching right now today and that we'll be sharing this with afterwards, um, they want to know A, should they get the vaccine? They've heard that it really doesn't help. Uh, B, what are the incubation, uh, what is the incubation okay. period? Yeah. And C, at blog pause, what can they expect? Should I mean, they're beginning to worry about bringing their pets. They're worried about communal water bowls. Can mm -hmm. you can yeah. you talk about that? Well, you know, we know a lot about H three N eight. We know that the H three N eight vaccine works very well for H three N eight virus. We do not know if it's going to help with H three N two. There's no data out there to suggest that it would, and there's no data that suggests that it wouldn't. There's a lot of anecdotal information. What we do know is out of the dogs that tested positive for dog flu um, in the Chicago area and surrounding area, <laughs> um, none of them had been vaccinated for dog flu before that. Um, and so we really don't know. Um, some some areas well, will recommend. I mean, the dog it. flu isn't something I would think about. I'm I'm not. I'm taking my dog. To, Steve, is that? Uh, do people normally want to go to the vet and say, hey, what about dog flu? Should I get a dog flu vaccine? It's not something we pet parents think about. So the nature of H3N8 historically in the United States has been it appears here and then it appears over there and over there. And where are the, the where there are these hot spots, <clears throat> then vaccination for social dogs, depends on the lifestyle of the dog, is absolutely, in my opinion, a good idea. And it isn't only to protect against the flu, it is also has protective properties against pneumonia. And this is why I think that even if, even if, even if, and you know, Dr. Jill isn't allowed to say certain things, you know, because I don't know. She's, with, <laughs> she's with the manufacturer that creates the vaccine, so I will say it. And this is my opinion based on what I know. Even if there's just a little bit of cross protection, there may be more, there may be less, we don't know. But if there is just a bit of cross protection, the H3N8 vaccine protects against pneumonia. If a dog dies of canine influenza, H3N8 or H3N2, it may well as a result of complications of pneumonia. So if we can prevent pneumonia, we are doing a lot to at least potentially prevent the mortality, with which is low and that's the other thing I mean most dogs that get this flu so their morbidity is high dogs get sick uh, but not all of them do so 20 to 25 percent it's thought of dogs with this virus show no symptoms at all which is great for those individual dogs they feel great they don't even know they have the flu yeah. no one's told them the problem is they're still infectious <laughs> and then another 75 percent or so do get sick but most of those dogs the symptoms are pretty mild, and it's just like, I believe my wife just walked in. It's, it's just like when we get the flu, sometimes we just feel cruddy, but we don't call the doctor, and in five days we're okay. This seems, I think, to take longer than five days, unfortunately, and, and for the cases where the dogs are coughing, this, what, what is often not talked about, so people in Chicago, and I hope people in Chicago are on this call, who say to me on the street, well, this is no big deal, well, they're not considering that what the impact is on their lifestyle. If your dog is up coughing all night long, you are up all night long coughing. And after a night or two or three of this, uh, the, the fun begins to wear out really, fa really fast. Also, also, there's a veterinary cost involved as well in the worst cases. And it's maybe 10%, maybe less. I don't think anyone knows. But the good news is it's a relatively small percent. But you don't know that your well, dog is going to be in that percent or not. Well, exactly, and I, I think for the purposes of today, um, we're getting questions about um, incubation period and taking, do, do we, don't take our dogs out anymore? I mean, do we not take them to the dog park? What do people have to be concerned about coming to blog pause? Um, I'm very concerned about that because, again, we do have quite a few dogs coming, and I haven't looked at my attendee list to see whether they're from Chicago. Um, 
I really want to get into the incubation period to whether or not it's passed in water or if it's just airborne. I'd like to talk about yeah. those kinds of things. And by the way, to the attendees and maybe to Steve and Jill, we might go a little bit longer than 30 minutes today. So I think That's we fine. have to cover this. <laughs> this is too well, I, I thought we yeah. had until 3 this afternoon. Oh, well, maybe we I do. thought we were on all day. All right, right. maybe that's the, what we'll all do. All my Jonathan. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, um, I, I see your, your questions you guys have, and it's um, very interesting. Well, for, back to H3N8, the dog flu is endemic in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. Those areas, um, I live in New Jersey, and my dog passed away. She was very old. But um, before, she would go to a boarding facility, so I vaccinated her for it because this is an endemic state. It's all over New York. Manhattan is covered with dog flu. Explain so what you mean by and Jill. Explain what you mean by endemic, so people know. Everybody, it's all, like um, it, there's always um, dogs coming up positive for dog flu in Manhattan um, from either the shelters or even the more um, you know, like the doggy daycares and stuff. So it's very endemic. It's endemic in Pennsylvania. New Jersey and New York. So this area, they, it's pretty common for people to vaccinate their dog for dog flu, and most veterinarians will talk to their uh, pet owners about it. Um, so it's more common here that they do that. Um, and again, um, we know we don't know if the H3N8 vaccine would cross protect um, against it. Um, so you know, at this point, I'd say we don't know. Um, and we also know that it's not just the Chicago dog flu, <laughs> Steve Dale. It's, um, it's actually been um, found in Iowa, um, Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And it's, there's some funny things going on in other areas. So it does spread really quickly. Um, it spreads through, it's just like the human flu. It spreads through coughing, like you just coughed just now. And if you had the flu and someone was sitting there and they inhaled it, they'd probably get sick. Um, it can be transmitted through barking, like a dog could bark on another dog and the saliva droplets, droplets could carry it. Um, they could be playing with the same toy. They could share a water bowl. Um, wow. You know, any type of saliva contact um, with between a dog um, and even inanimate, inanimate, inanimate objects could, could transfer it. Uh, so so a dog period, bed, if, if I had, my dog was laying in the dog bed and, and had it and someone came uh -huh. to visit and laid in the dog bed, their dog could get it. Well, if you have a, if your dog like had some kind of respiratory secretions on, and which you know my dog drooled everywhere, and there's like still dro drool all over the walls where she she sprinkle it all over the walls when she shook her head, they will not come off. So if you have a drooly dog and your dog's laying down and this saliva is there, and the other dog comes by and you know they could potentially get it that way. But the uh, most wanna... common route is through coughing, coughing, barking, you know, contact that way. I, I want to jump in there because veterinarians are asking about lifestyle after dogs. They they want to know if these dogs have been to boarding facilities or kennels or dog parks. Uh, and and one of the big areas of transmission is elevators, actually, high-rise buildings. Uh -oh. uh, these dogs really are good about not going to dog-friendly areas. They're not being boarded. They're not being kenneled. They don't know how they're getting it. Well, it's in the elevator of these buildings. If a dog goes to a pet store, and, and how often does this happen, licks at a package of dog food and isn't even sick, uh, let's say that dog is going to get sick. That's the other thing that Dr. Jill will talk about. They shed mm -hmm. the virus. They spread the virus. They are contagious before they even get sick. So that dog... That dog's owner has no way to know. That dog licks at some pet food at a pet store, which happens every day. Another healthy dog comes along, even up to two days later, and sniffs or licks at the same package. That's how long the virus can live a day or two on objects. Well, they say maybe more 24 hours, not 48. Okay. More like 24 <laughs> So, so what? What? First of all, very quickly, because I think this is a short answer. It's it's not something people can get from their dog. No, no, no. It's not no. transmissible to humans. Okay. Second, it is that, transmissible to cats. Yeah, that's that's the other thing. Is it transmissible to cats? And then what what should I be telling my attendees? Well, um, that you know, to there's not really we don't know that there's a proven vaccine out there. There's no way to prevent the disease a hundred percent right now. We don't know if the vaccine would help or not. Um, but we do know that with an infectious respiratory disease, the way to stop the spread is to stop social contact between dogs. 
So I think it's a matter of just educating them, letting them know the risks are out there. A majority of dogs, like Steve said, are going to have very mild signs, um, a, like a low-grade fever, lethargy, sometimes a little coughing. Um, the more severe or um, pneumonia or the death, is, it's more rare. Um, and again, there, there were only six confirmed deaths in the Chicago area, even though thousands of dogs were ill. Um, but there were a lot of dogs that developed pneumonia, and they were treated and they recovered. Um, but it is a pretty long process. It seems like it's, uh, it's not just like, you know, a little cold. It usually, the recovery takes like a week or two for the dog to get fully recovered. So, so how, how concerned should we be if, for instance, nobody from Iowa or Chicago was coming? Well, we want people from Chicago and Iowa to come to Blog Paws. <laughs> I know. Maybe that's that's my Iowa. point, Steve. Yeah. Uh, and cats, I think, too. Um, I, I, I want to jump in there because cat owners sometimes panic. Uh, no cat has been diagnosed positively, as far as I know, uh, Jill, anyway, in the Chicago area. Yeah, not, nothing really. I mean, again, cats and dogs are mortal em enemies. No. Um, their cats aren't out yeah, and, you know, socializing. They're at home. Um, so there's a good chance they're going to be safe just because of their lifestyle. <laughs> yes, um, and, and people that don't have a dog and don't really pet dogs all that often and associate with dogs, and they have two or three cats at home. I mean, they're probably but, but there's fine. a lot of interaction at Blog Paws, Steve. I mean, you know that oh, yeah, the yeah, dogs yeah, yeah, yeah. are constantly together. Oh. The cats are being pushed in strollers. Here's my personal opinion. Uh -oh. All, that's all it is, Yvonne. But you asked, and, and uh, Dr. Jill can offer hers. If blog paws were being held today, and it's not, if it were held today, I would say it, don't bring dogs from the Chicago area. I don't know how you define that. I can give you the counties, and Jill could do a better job, actually, giving you counties where it's been identified, uh, and, and perhaps not from Iowa as well. Just don't bring them. Wisconsin, benefiting, benefiting Indiana, your dog and Ohio. And the other dogs there. Hmm? Yeah. You'd add other places, Jill? But, um, well, we, we do know it's confirmed in Wisconsin, which, you know, if you look at the map, um, you know, Wisconsin's right there. Indiana, we got a positive in Indiana right yes. really quickly in the early, early stages. Um, and then we have, there have been positive in Ohio. I spoke to a vet yesterday who, they're starting to see an outbreak in Sioux City, Iowa. It's all over the news. And they, they ha, you know, they, they found it was a positive case, too. So if you look at Sioux City, Iowa, and Chicago, I mean, there's not much going on between there. And that's not like a, a mecca for Chicagoans to go on vacation to Sioux City, Iowa. So, I mean, it may be other places, too, because we're not testing every single sick dog. We do have our ears, you know, out and open looking for other you know, situations where they're starting to see the, the spread, but um, but it is very infectious. And I would say definitely if a dog is sick or um, has been sick recently or is even feeling a little lethargic, um, you know, maybe not bring that dog because the dog may, may be in the early stages of developing flu. Um, the only good thing is is that the flu is a very wimpy virus and disinfecting things with just, you know, bleach or any, any kind of disinfectant would kill the virus. Um, the issue is, is dogs having contact with each other, even if they're not from Chicago, you don't know if the dog has it or not, especially if the dog is very social and has been out and about with other dogs. That dog, you know, may have been able to pick it up. So we really don't have a solution here. Well, in, yeah. my, in my opinion, where you know there is a problem, uh, those dogs probably shouldn't be traveling. And, and whatever those places are, right now, it seems Sioux City, Iowa, and Chicago. And, well, in my opinion, individual dogs have been identified in these other cities. It's not been an outbreak in those other cities. And, yes, there's some risk, but then there's risk to life. You know, so I, I would say be careful. Uh, but but definitely not dogs from Chicago or the Chicago area or apparently Sioux City, Iowa, because you're asking really for trouble. And and you as I as Jill described and I described, these dogs are contagious before they actually get sick. Twenty five percent of the dogs that are sick are not showing <laughs> symptoms, even though they have the virus. So it's very difficult even for the most amazing veterinarian on the planet to know yeah. that that dog is harboring the flu or not in some cases. Mm -hmm. 
But the good news is you can bring guinea pigs and they're fine. Probably you guys want to answer some questions. <laughs> bring here. your guinea pigs. Bring your guinea pigs. B-Y-O-G-D. B-Y-O-G-D. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> it can't jump to humans. That was one of the questions. Um, <clears throat> someone wanted to know how long to wait before they take them to the groomer or, to, or, or out to the dog park or put them in a kennel, yeah. you know. do you you... Know, nobody, nobody knows, really. Nobody knows right now at all. Um, I mean, if you're in an area where you don't have it, you don't know if it's if it's coming that way, and if you're in an area like Chicago right now, they're still seeing cases. This has been going on for over 30 days, and they're still seeing a lot of cases coming in. So it's spreading around like crazy still. <clears throat> Is there any end to it? I don't. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, you know, honestly, I've never seen anything spread this quickly. Even, um, I mean, even h 3 8 it spreads very quickly, but this. It's spreading like like I've never seen it. I mean, it seems like it spreads even quicker than a human flu. When, you know, you like talk, a, human flus don't spread like this, right? Yeah. When, when you talk to old-time veterinarians, Jill, what they do is they tell me about parvovirus back in the day. Uh, and, well, parvovirus killed many more animals. It, it, it's, yeah, it's yeah, nice it's horrible. Um, I also want to say one thing. The vaccine, don't go on the Internet. Jill, I need to talk to you about this at some point. But our county okay. veterinarian reported to me that there are vaccines now being made available on the internet by providers that don't have approved vaccines. That's illegal. That's dangerous. It's illegal. Don't do yeah. It. Yeah. The USDA in in veterinary medicine, the USDA monitors vaccines, and to create a vaccine, like Steve Dell can't create his own vaccine in his office no. today and put it out in the market. You actually have to have facilities, you have to prove the safety, the efficacy, the purity of the vaccine. So if you're not getting a vaccine that's not approved in the U.S. and it's not a USDA approved vaccine, then it would not be considered, I'm sure it's not considered legal, but I, I wouldn't use it. I definitely wouldn't use it. But are you it hasn't gone through that strict are you recommending that, that, I mean, Steve's point being that even though the vaccine, we aren't 100% sure, we don't know if it will um, be effective for this canine flu, it is effective to help with pneumonia or whatever. So are you recommending people get the vaccine regardless? I am. Well, we're, you know, we're not recommending it. If they're we, social, we if just, they're we social dogs. Yeah, we just know that, um, we just know that we don't know if it's going to be effective or not. But um, certain states like Indiana Veterinary Medical Association is recommending to vaccinate them with the canine influenza vaccine. So some, you know, I would say just talk to your veterinarian, see what your veterinarian thinks. <clears throat> we can talk to your veterinarian too and provide them with information to make an informed decision. But, you know, honestly, we don't know. Um, and also while we were sampling Chicago area, we also found that there was Bordetella, adenovirus, parainfluenza out there too. Um, not as much as the dog flu, but those are actually diseases that can be prevented through vaccination. So there's uh, like intranasal vaccines that have adenovirus, Bordetella, and parainfluenza that can provide protection for those diseases. Well, so so Colorado, is it something I should be concerned about? Should I be calling my vet after this call and get them in to have them vaccinated? They're not coming to blog pause, but... Yeah. Well, I would, you know, again, I would talk to your veterinarian. Um, speaking of Colorado, the weird thing is Colorado is considered endemic for H3N8 already. It's one of the states that um, has had a high incidence of, of the H3N8 um, dog flu. So it's very common in Chicago to vaccinate your dog for the dog flu. Um, it's weird because Colorado's over here, and then all the, the yeah, major yeah. areas like Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, we're all over here. Um, but for some reason, and also Wyoming, there's a high incidence of, of H3N8 that's been found. Um, so, you know, in that situation, if you're doing it for H3N8 anyway, you know, if it does cross-protect, you're in luck. But, you know, again, we just don't know if it cross-protects. Uh, Dr. Jill, there's a question here that I, I want to answer. I have four dogs. If my dogs haven't been sick, have not been sick, or have shown any signs of the illness, how long should I wait to bring them around to other dogs, groomers, dog parks, etc. I am getting this question every day in Chicago because people yeah. here are getting very impatient. 
They want to socialize. You know, I yeah. see dogs on the street. I, I run the other way. And people say, Steve Dales, you're <laughs> rude. So how long do we need to not socialize and be careful in the Chicago area? I yeah. suggest you. Do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> I have a crystal ball, and it says, I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, it, from what we're learning, it seems like that none of, you know, of course, none of the dogs have been exposed to this before. It's new. It's from Korea originally. So they're not going to have any kind of a defense. So most dogs are going to get it or, or get it and spread the disease and may not show obvious signs. So if you kept your dogs inside and they haven't gotten sick, that's good. But if you take them out, there's a chance if it's still out there, and it, it seems like it's still out there from what I'm hearing, that they could pick it up. And, and by the way, I'm here to tell you uh, that in Chicago, it is still, I talked to our Donna Alexander, the county veterinarian yesterday, and mm -hmm. she is absolutely still considering this uh, an epidemic. Well, I, yeah. I guess yeah. the more I hear you, you talk about it, the more I say to myself, so why is it so serious in the areas that you mentioned and not spreading elsewhere? What? I mean, uh, why well, Chicago? It is, it is spreading elsewhere. Yeah. But why it, it Chicago? Yeah, I know. Why Chicago, Steve? <laughs> why Chicago? It's I know. Good. We don't know. Yeah. It's, why did it start in Chicago? I don't know. When we did our surveillance data, the interesting thing is the first positive case we found was on March 16th in Darien, Illinois, which is outside Chicago. Um, the next then we didn't see anything, and then around the 23rd or 24th, we had some in Naperville, which is a, is a distance from Darien, right? Yes. And, yes. and then Chicago, like all heck breaks loose, it's all over Chicago. You know, we have so many positive cases from there, and then it starts going to the different suburbs of Chicago, like Hoffman Estates, um, Wheaton, Oz Oswego, I don't know how to say it, um, you know, all these surrounding Oswego. And then it goes to Indiana. Um, and then since then it's gone to Wisconsin, like through probably the Green Bay area is right on the Chicago area. No, Green Bay is not um, near Chicago. spread through Indiana. Oh, it is? Okay. And then it's also gone south in Chicago, um, south in Illinois, um, Ohio, and now it's in Iowa. You know, um, so it's, like I said, it's, it's nothing like you've seen before. It's just spreading like crazy. Well, it, it, so it, some people, um, <clears throat> many of our attendees have said here and, and have written to us and said, what, what are the side effects? You know, if their veterinarian is saying, well, no, you don't need to have oh, it, um, but now they're hearing yeah. from you and Steve that maybe it's not a bad idea. Are there side effects? Yeah. Well, with any vaccine, there's side effects. Um, no matter what you give your dog, there, there are side effects. Of course, the side effects are very, very minimal and, and you know, very, very low. Um, but you can see side effects. Even people have side effects to vaccines. So, um, so for someone to say there's no side effects, they're crazy. Um, but this vaccine has a very, it has an excellent safety profile and excellent efficacy profile. In our safety studies, we didn't see anything obvious when we did safety studies with the vaccine. Um, in the clinical trials, over 700 dogs were vaccinated twice with the vaccine. Um, but it's a, it's a killed virus vaccine. Uh, another, another killed virus vaccine that you guys would be familiar with would be rabies. So rabies is also, it's the rabies virus, it's a killed vaccine. So, it's, so the, what you would see with the rabies vaccination, you would see with the canine influenza vaccination. So that would be signs of like malaise, lethargy, sometimes they'll vomit. You can have a hypersensitivity type 1 reaction where an animal would have an anaphylaxis um, with any vaccine. Um, and again, the instance rate is very, very low. But, um, but any vaccine has that potential risk. Um, some dog breeds that are more sensitive to vaccinations across the board are usually dachshunds. Have you noticed that? <laughs> dachshunds get a vaccine, they, they swell up, and they get hives okay. a lot. They seem okay. to be very, they're like the most common. Um, schnauzers and boxers, things, dogs like that, they do send, seem to be, and pugs, they do send, tend to be a little bit mm -hmm. vaccine sensitive. But in general, it has a very low rate of, of side effects. Um, I do recommend any time you vaccinate your pet to monitor them very closely, especially if they've in the past have had any vaccine reactions, um, and then talk to your vet if you do see anything unusual. 
So it, it blog paws. If indeed um, folks bring their their dogs and their cats, what would you recommend mm -hmm. that we do to make sure we can keep these animals safe? Well, <laughs> I can also send you some some details. You know, it's it's like the flu. It's like the human flu. So if somebody from blog, if Steve Dale comes into blog paws and he has a, the flu. Um, you know, he could spread it through shaking hands, coughing all over everybody. Um, so they might grab a glass and drink after him or something. So think of each dog as being a potential, like potentially having the flu. So if you can limit the dog to dog contact, which is sad because dogs love to be with dogs. Yeah. Um, I, if you can I, make sure. I don't know how to yeah, do that. Sure we have, that a, <clears throat> we have a know. dedicated <laughs> dog park where people can drop their dogs off if they want to go about yeah. unencumbered. I mean, they can bring their dogs with oh, them really? everywhere. Uh, but we have a park. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. And, uh, well, my, you have, my, to, they have to go individually, and then you have to clean it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. my, that wouldn't work. Yeah. My opinion might be different than, than Jill's, and we're coming yeah. at it from two different points of view maybe. I would say if you live in an area where there is currently dog flu happening for log paws benefit and your own dog's benefit, don't go. That that would be the best solution. You mean don't and bring your dog? Areas, pardon me? We still want you to come. Just don't bring your dog. Correct. However, very correct. However, uh, if you live in other areas, the risk is there. Uh, more than any other time, but it's still somewhat minimal. If you live in I don't know if you live in uh, West Virginia. Yeah, or <laughs> where somebody I know people lives in West or, Virginia. So if, you live in Baton, so if you live in Baton Rouge, where there's never been dog flu of any kind, I'd say live your life. You know, um, odds are you're fine. But if you know that there are other dogs all around you that currently have the dog flu, like in the Chicago area at the moment, and apparently like in Sioux City, Iowa and maybe yeah. other places by the time the conference is, for those dogs, not people, for those dogs, stay home. For the people, instead of bringing your dog, bring another person to blog pause. <laughs> and your flat pack. <laughs> um, yeah. so, That's just my so, honest opinion. I think this has been very helpful. It's also perhaps raised some other concerns and questions that will pop up after um, after we yeah. sign off here. Um, we're a little bit over time, but I think that we had to, we started late, and we did have to cover the questions that um, mm -hmm. everybody was asking. And thank you, Amy and, and Jerry and, and Karma Pudel and, and Talon Hounds and all the folks who chimed in and um, shared your concerns and your questions and, and um, keep them coming. I mean, wh what we'll do is you can email BlogPause, you can email Yvonne at blogpause.com, and I will then stay in touch with Jill and Steve. Yeah. And, um, you know, we'll see where we can help alleviate any concerns and where <laughs> we can um, make sure people are educated so they understand what's happening and they're not reading something outrageous on the internet and, and saying, oh my God. Mm. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Did you see? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just, I, I just want to say, and this is really important. Uh, Merck Animal Health has been incredibly responsive. Not only Dr. Jill Lopez here, but other veterinarians from Merck have been just incredible uh, in helping. First of all, to identify what this is in the first place, and really stepping up voluntarily as a company. Uh, as well as I thank personally Dr. Lopez for spending her, her time this morning. Yes, indeed, and I have to agree. <laughs> you too, Steve. So Jill had a great time. Excuse me. Excuse Did me. Did you see Karma's notes? Did yes. you see Karma's content? She says yeah. she's bringing a gallon of ProVet sanitizer to Blog Pause, and I approve, <laughs> Karma. So you you bring that I along. I too. You know, we'll run around and sanitize everything. I I. I really appreciate the two of you helping out with this. It is a concern. It will continue to be um, something that people are concerned about, but now we have something to share with uh, the attendees, the would-be attendees, and just the general public who is asking about this canine flu and isn't getting the answers. They're, they're guessing or their friend is telling them something they heard uh, secondhand. So I really, truly appreciate it. And before we sign off, uh, Jill was going to show us New Jersey, and oh, yes, perhaps. New Jersey. And also, oh, also, I was going to tell you. Um, 
I will send you some updated information, like tips on how to keep the spread of the disease to the minimal. Okay. And um, you can go on doginfluenza.com, and you can get a lot of information there. We yes. recently had a webinar with a very famous uh, veterinarian, Dr. Justine Lee. She's phenomenal. Um, and also with Dr. Debovi. It's mainly for veterinarians and technicians, but um, if you go on there, you can link on there and watch it. It gives you a lot of information. So, do you see New Jersey? <coughs> Yes, it's lovely. Oh, look at the flowers. Look at the so you get to look at this out your window every day. How nice. Yeah. Yeah, look oh. how So so quickly, Dr. Jill, uh, before we sign off, we'd like to ask our guests <laughs> to tell us what their pet project is. Do you have a pet project you'd like to share with us? Maybe this is it. Um like personal pet project or Whatever. work pet project? Whatever is <laughs> something you're you're willing to share with with us, we'd love to hear it. Well, um, well, right now I guess um I guess I should keep it business. Um, I'm trying to collect all this data that we've had that we with the surveillance, and I'm I'm gathering that data, and I'm working on um we're going to be writing an article to publish this information to spread it out, spread it out to. So every, every veterinarian will know about it. So right now that's one of the things that I'm doing. That's fabulous, fabulous. Well, do let us know, um, even though it's for I will, I will. I'll definitely it would be get great. Um, so Steve, yeah. Steve, now, thank you so much for organizing this. And you, you're always someone I know I can tap into when I have something serious or something um, that's relevant to the entire pet community, not just blog paws, and as this was today. Tell us what your pet project is. I've got many of them. So I'll tell you one of them. <laughs> and, and this is the first time I've talked about this ever, anywhere. Excellent. Um, uh -uh. I'm, 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 and maybe we could talk about this at Blog Pause next year in 2016, if, if you so desire. Okay. I'm working with. I'm going to tell what it is. He's going to be on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you should do a blogger's version of that. <laughs> yeah. But I would be the first one to be eliminated, I'm sure. But unless unless Jill is my partner, then then I'm sure we go on and win the. They would definitely be eliminated first. <laughs> the, the mirror ball or whatever. Um, we we have a problem in this country with uh, not enough pets seeing the veterinarian. Veterinary visits are down, and as a result of the decline in visits and preventive health care, we know that preventive illness is up. Those those two are related. There are reasons we've now identified as to why pets are not going to the veterinarian. And I'm working with a veterinary behaviorist to address a lot of that. And uh, by the end of this year, by fall of this year, we will have the results of what we've done. We're going to begin at some major uh, veterinary conferences and some smaller ones too, uh, talking with veterinary professionals about our work. And then in 2016-17, uh, we uh, will talk to the general public about what mm -hmm. they can do, and in between all of that, um, maybe even a blog pause. Well, that's, that's one. We, yes. What else? What else? You want to tell us? Oh one no, more? you don't want to. We're late already, you guys. Yeah, don't we are. Yeah, but you know, this is important. So, so before we sign off, Jill, is there um, some way you want to share with the audience on how they might get in touch with you, or would you yeah, prefer them yeah. to go through me? Oh, you can email me. Um, I usually have my phone with me, and I, even three or four o'clock in the morning, sometimes I'm awake, so I will probably email you back at weird times. Um, my email is just my name, Jill J I L L dot Lopez L O P E Z at Merck M E R C K dot com. Excellent. And Steve, yeah. how can we get in yes. touch with you? Well, I've actually know. Because of requests, I've actually set up about this very issue, uh, dog flu at stevedale.tv, uh, where wow. some of the questions I've answered uh, with uh, your colleague at Merck, actually, uh, and uh, Dr. Natalie Marks, a Chicago veterinarian, is working with me as well with this, who I know uh, Dr. Lopez knows of. Uh, and in oh, addition, yes. To, yes, and in addition, my blog is uh, Chicago Now dot com forward slash Steve Dale and uh, the first person to read every blog post I write I believe is Jill 
It's ChicagoNow.com. It is me. I read it religiously. <laughs> you put it that in your uh, blog. Uh, forward slash ChicagoNow.com forward slash Steve Dale. Well, well, thank you both, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you were willing to spend the time today. Uh, and we're going to circulate this video in various places. We will make sure people have that information on how to get in touch with you, and I will pass along <coughs> excuse me, any other uh, questions that come my way. So again, okay. from Blog Pause, Yvonne DeVita, and in the background, our producer today was Tom Collins. Um, Hi, Tom. Thank you. Tom. <laughs> I love your name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we will see, uh, see you again soon. Perhaps we'll do another show like this. It was fabulous. Thank you so much yeah. for, for uh, spending time with us. Thank you for Thank making you this possible, Thank Blog Pause. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.